Um, I'm really excited about talking with you guys today because I wanted to um, bounce a bunch of ideas off you. And I, and I, I you know, full disclosure, they go from uh, somewhat baked to raw dough. And um, so when we get to the end of the talk, there's a bunch of stuff I've been thinking about that I would love to have great conversations with great people about. And I invite you all to, uh, to be part of that. Um, what I wanted to talk about today is uh, building a sustainable data ecosystem. I'm going to give you the world's most unsurprising first slide. Um, this is something that um, probably any one of you, when you give talks, um, and you need to make the case for why data is important, especially as we look towards innovation and discovery. Um, there's any number of questions that data drives. Data drives pretty much everything. And so whether I'm trying to figure out, you know, public health or I'm trying to figure out agricultural productivity or whether there's a God particle or, you know, any number of things. And usually from a talk like this, you start and, um, and then you go on and do all the gee whiz, really cool, uh, you know, cover of the New York Times stuff. Um, that data drives. So you talk about, you know, how did you do it and what are your algorithms and how did you figure out who was going to get the flu, um, et cetera. And typically what people don't do is start talking about the stuff you need in order to answer these questions. And that's the data infrastructure. So, you know, just putting that data out there just isn't enough. We all know that because we all work with data. Um, you need a lot of, uh, you need to do a lot of things. Um, it's not an asset if you don't know what it means. You know, if you can't find it, it's not an asset. It's not useful unless it's in the right form for analysis. If you want to reproduce it, somebody has got to be hosting it in the first place, and you have to worry about keeping it over the long term. So it turns out that data infrastructure, which is the most unsexy part of data science and the data world, but really critical. You know, it's very, you know, if we want to do things with water, we need plumbing, we need to know how to turn on uh, the water faucet, we even know that that's where the, need to know that that's where the water lives. And so when we think about data, um, one of the most difficult thing is sort of prioritizing the development and maintenance and sustaining of data infrastructure um, adequately so we can do all the really cool and interesting work we want to do with data. So, um, you know, part of that is stewardship and preservation. If your data doesn't live anywhere, it's going to disappear. And, um, and, and these days, as um, there's an increasing focus on let's put more of it out there, we have open access, um, the feds want us to um, take the products of our research data and make sure that uh, people can access it. We want to use it, we want to re, uh, reuse it. A lot of talk about reproducibility. You need to have a data management plan. If your data doesn't live anywhere, management is easy. You're not doing anything. And so stewardship and preservation end up being really important. And that's stewardship and preservation of your data and the infrastructure you need to do that. So what that should sound like, um, I think, to all of us is we're trying to sustain the digital environment. It's a sustainability question. And so, you know, what, how do we think about sustainability questions? And one of the best places to kind of um, cue off of is the real world, where we're trying to sustain our natural resources, we're trying to sustain, we're trying to make our cities livable and uh, safe and, um, and really enabling for all of the people that live there. And so, um, if you look in the literature, there's a lot of really interesting work around um, sustainability of the environments we all live in. And the UN has done a lot of really interesting stuff. The Brundtland uh, Commission some years ago actually sat down, um, really went through what do we mean by sustainable development, that's that we want uh, to, uh, we want to be able to be here now. We want to be able to evolve into the future in a positive way. And, and really started thinking about, you know, all of the factors that you need to do that can be kind of clumped into four different areas. Um, ecology, uh, economics, uh, culture, and politics. So one thing we can think about as we're looking at the sustainable digital environment is what kind of issues do we have to think about in all four of those spaces in order to really create the right kind of environment for us to sustain the data on which we are, you know, in which we depend. And we are coming to depend more and more 
uh, everywhere you look. So today I want to do kind of an a exploration of some questions in each of these areas and talk about some work that I've been involved in um, in each of these areas. So if you think about ecology, in some sense, you know, that brings us really easily to infrastructure. <laughs> So we need to build infrastructure. That infrastructure allows us to use data, to host data, to preserve data, um, to couple data with services, to mine data, et cetera. How do we develop uh, more of it and make it more useful? So that's a question I want to talk, I think about in ecology. Um, economics, you know, all of that infrastructure uh, has a price tag. And uh, one thing that we often don't talk about is who's going to pay the data bill. I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, there's also culture associated with it. Where are the needs of, of biggest importance? Which communities sort of are doing pretty well? Which communities are not doing pretty well? Where are there gaps in infrastructure? I want to talk about that. And at the end, and this is definitely my raw dough, I want to do a few slides on you know, what you can think about as the brave new world which is the Internet of Things, and all of the data associated with that, and basically how can we evolve that so it doesn't become Lord of the Flies. So, um, so let's start with ecology. Aha. And, you know, so one question you can ask as you look at all these research questions from um, the first slide is, um, well, what kind of infrastructure do I actually need? You know, if I want to know who's at risk for asthma, if I want to know, um, you know, um, how accurate is the standard model of physics, etc. And it turns out that we need a lot of building blocks. And these are things, you know, people come together to make all the time. Um, various kinds of tools, various kinds of standards, algorithms, policies that allow us to understand when I can access the data and distribute it, um, different kinds of infrastructure that allow us to audit the data or um, capture the data provenance or um, train people about the data. Uh, et cetera. So there's all of these building blocks. People get together, they build them every day in the context of their companies or their projects or the government, et cetera. And if you'll notice, um, this is not just technical infrastructure. So a really important part of the infrastructure we need to build is what I think of as social infrastructure. So if you think about it, policy makes this tremendous difference. It changes behavior. So if you go somewhere and it says, you know, no smoking, or you must be this high to ride this uh, roller coaster, or something like that, it changes the behavior and how people deal with it. And when the NIH says, if you do a certain kind of research funded by us, um, you need to put your, uh, the products of your research in the protein data bank, your protein structures. Or when NIH says, if you do Alzheimer's research, um, and it's funded by us, you need to put it in these um, accessible um, data collections. What does that mean? That means that now I have more data. What does more data do for me? It means I have a bigger pa patient population. It means if I want to do trends from noise analysis, there are some phenomena I'm more likely to see in a bigger space than a smaller space. So, you know, these are really, really useful for us um, policy, social infrastructure. Um, what, you know, you can kind of think of social infrastructure as, as common standards. We come together, we make agreements about things. When I go to Home Depot, they don't just cut lumber whatever size they feel like every day. Um, they have um, uh, industry standards, and that's so I can buy lumber and I can go ahead and then interoperate with the plumber and the electrician and the architect and all the other people who are trying to build things with me. It's not a perfect size, perhaps, but we all kind of get used to working in a common space so we can do things that are more than uh, the sum of our parts. Systems operability is a really good example of that. Um, it would be great if the community together would come together and worldwide figured out, you know, one power system and one uh, plug and one shape, size, et cetera, then I can go to any hotel room in the world and uh, plug in my laptop, no worries. That doesn't happen right now, but it's not a problem. For me, it's not about the plugs. The plugs are a means to an end. What I want to do is get to the hotel room and, and read my email. The last uh, couple of weeks ago when Bonnie and I were both in Paris, I brought my Parisian plug adapter, and in March, when the RDA meeting will be in Tokyo, there'll be a different plug adapter, but they both allow me to do what I need to do. Um, sustainable economics, we'll talk more about that, goes without saying. If your infrastructure has no business model, 
you may have no infrastructure. Um, adopted community practice, you know, I always really love to use the driving example. Um, you know, there are DMV rules, we have to go by them, but the fact is when you get to an intersection, um, you know, Department of Motor Vehicle rules don't cover everything. And we have ways that we kind of agree to interact with each other to try to minimize accidents. And of course, training and education, that's really important. If we can't use our technology, our technology is not uh, useful to us. Um, that's a, a little bit of the uh, same thing. But you know, uh, you know, the technology can bring me water. But if I don't know that I turn on the water faucet, and that's what the water faucet's purpose is and how to turn that on, um, it's not useful. So all of these kinds of social and technical infrastructure are needed, and I think oftentimes we forget about the social infrastructure. So this brings me to the Research Data Alliance, and this is an organization that had a very, it's a community-driven organization, had a very specific purpose to start. And the idea was to accelerate the building of infrastructure for data sharing and for doing research. And so that's what people in RDA do. Um, uh, we kind of invented it uh, about three years ago. Um, people from the United States and from Australia and from uh, Europe and other places. And it's grown uh, in a short three years into a community of 3,200, 3,300 people from over 100 countries. And the need that RDA is trying to fill is you have a problem, infrastructure is your roadblock. Can you build a piece of infrastructure that allows you to look at your problem and then move on? And um, so um, it's really attracted a lot of people who want to build infrastructure, which typically is not prioritized very highly. Innovation prioritized highly, and infrastructure not so much. And especially for about two thirds of our members are academics, and the other uh, third are from government and industry and, um, and all kinds of places. But um, typically in many of these worlds, the building of infrastructure is not prioritized. And uh, the RDA provides people um, a, an opportunity to meet with people all over the world who are worried about the same kinds of problems that they are and to really expand their horizons about it. New solutions, new approaches, and then to actually build things. Now, um, the approach is very pragmatic. Uh, you, know, the, the, you know, if you use RDA as a vehicle, if you join, it's free. Um, um, you do it because you want to solve problems and just make progress on the building of infrastructure. And, um, so RDA members come together in two ways. One is working groups, who are groups that are actually building uh, very specific pieces of infrastructure that somebody is going to adopt. And interest groups, who are more discussive groups, sort of thinking about, you know, what kind of infrastructure is needed, what kinds of problems needs to be solved, and then they often spin off working groups to build the kind of infrastructure they want. Remember that infrastructure is social infrastructure as well. You may develop a policy or a set of standards that people uh, then adopt within the group. And, and the culture um, has been really interesting as it's evolved. Um, first of all, it's not a build it and they will come. It's, it's, you know, build something that solves somebody's problem. It doesn't have to solve everybody's problem. If it solves more people's problem than those people, um, that's great. Um, and so we want to amplify um, the outputs of RDA groups whenever possible. But it has to solve somebody's problem. Um, second of all, um, RDA is really kind of technology neutral. So you build something that solves your problem, that doesn't mean, um, you know, we think it's like the only thing. Um, there is no kind of, uh, or at least organizationally, we think there's no kind of one infrastructure solution to every single problem. And the idea is to accommodate people who have problems, need to build infrastructure, and then keep on climbing up uh, Innovation Mountain uh, for where they're going. And, and then the other idea is to really amplify the impact and let people know about it so we can prioritize the results of people's work as well as um, the development of the infrastructure itself. Um, I thought I would um, give you a couple of slides on what people are actually doing in the RDA. It's a community-driven organization, so people um, build stuff that, uh, that is of use to them. And uh, RDA is kind of a Noah's Ark of all different kinds of people. You find uh, physicists and marine biologists and librarians and information scientists and um, people who run data centers and journalists and government lab people and all kinds of people coming to RDA. So you get a very heterogeneous um, set of input uh, when you're doing things. What we found is that our groups are really interested in solving problems kind of somewhere in this space. 
So we have you know, anywhere from data provisors to data consumers and technical to social. So say if you start up there at the social and data provider space, um, typically keywords you'll find in people's working groups and charters are they're looking at governance and certification and metrics and evaluation, cost recovery, legal issues around data. And so, for example, here's some of the groups um, that you know one might sort of assign to that. So the RDA Codata Legal Interoperability Group is really looking at interoperability around different legal systems. We have data cost recovery uh, centers, uh, uh, recovery for centers, et cetera. Um, if you look now to the consumer space in the social space, you see education and, um, and all kinds of infrastructure sort of around the social space. So um, we have folks that are looking at um, curriculum for summer schools on data science in Africa and people looking at libraries for research data and quality of urban life. As we look at the more technical solutions uh, in the data consumer space, then you find a lot of groups coming around domains. So digital practices and hi history and ethnography, you know, what kind of data infrastructure do I need to do to support uh, digital humanities, for example, materials data, structural biology, et cetera. And then there's sort of a lot of under the hood stuff too. Um, when you look at data providers and technical solutions, you'll see people looking at domain repositories, preservation infrastructure, data type registries, you know, big data analytics, data fabrics, where you're making things interoperate, et cetera. This is just a sampling. Right now, there's about 60 groups um, in uh, RDA, and about 40-ish, uh, 40, 40 to 45 of them are interest groups. We also have working groups. So these are the guys who are talking about how they're going to spin off, what pieces of infrastructure they want to do. Here are the people who've actually built infrastructure. So as you'll, you'll see, most of this stuff is under the hood. There are people who want to help you cite your data in a really precise way, even though the data collection might vary and the publication has uh, some sort of evolutionary history. There are people who um, are worried about metadata standards for various areas. Um, one of our first sort of domain groups that um, created infrastructure is the Wheat Data Interoperability Group. And that's a group who wants to look at agricultural productivity. They want to combine a germplasm data set for wheat with a terrestrial data set, with air quality. You know, they want to ask questions like, what strains of wheat are likely to be most productive in this area? You know, how can we address hunger issues is sort of the um, policy sort of side of that. And they're developing an interoperability framework that's then being adopted by a number of people to answer the questions that they're answering. So it's a real pragmatic thing. Um, one of the best things about RDA um, that kind of surprised us a little bit is the meetings themselves. So these are working meetings. And I would say, um, I don't know, uh, Bonnie can uh, tell me if she thinks I'm wrong, but at least 50, 60 percent of these meetings are people running around talking to each other about their work. So, you know, there's typically some great speakers in the morning and the, you know, government panel and stuff like that. But really, almost all the time, people do work. And because it's, and I know it sounds like an incredibly international, uh, international and exotic set of places, but most of these places are inconvenient for about 95% of the people in RDA. So um, everybody works hard to show up at the meetings and travel very, very long, expensive uh, trips to kind of go and um, then really work with other, people's in their, other people in their groups and sort of get stuff done. Um, we were just in Paris. We had over 700 people there. And, you know, everybody tries to do something special. And uh, what the Parisians did is they brought a bunch of startup companies um, who were coming and using RDA outputs and really talking about the stuff that they did. And that was just amazing and fascinating. Um, the next, uh, the plenaries are typically March-ish, September, October-ish. In March, we'll be in Tokyo. In September and, uh, or October, we'll be here in the US. And we're trying to figure out we're going to be with another group. We're trying to figure out kind of where's, where's someplace that's big enough to uh, accommodate us all. But I'll, I'll let you know if you're interested or sign up on the RDA website. Um, one more thing on RDA, it's like, where are we going? And what does it mean for uh, us to be, what's our metrics of success? Um, first and foremost, you know, the, we're, we're about building infrastructure. So, you know, we'll be a successful organization over time if there's a continuing pipeline of infrastructure that people are using 
find useful. This provides a vehicle for them to do this in an easier way. Um, and, and it's also, you know, if we can keep um, working with others to kind of coalesce the community um, and really interact and, and build kind of linkages in the community, RDA is not a world domination kind of organization. The idea is to work really successfully with other people trying to do other things and, and then try to create some synergy out of that. And of course, you know, this creates global synergy. You know, um, all of these groups have um, people from all over the place. And so you get to know, you know, how are you handling things in the Netherlands and in Singapore and in Botswana as well as how are you handling things in your own backyard? Or how are, you know, ethnographers handling that uh, and you're a computer science or an, a scientist or an information scientist. So that kind of expanded perspective is really important. RDA really cares about generational stuff as well. And it's very important to all of us that um, RDA is a very intergenerational organization, so we take great pains to get students and early career professionals into the RDA because really that's, that's where all of this is going. Um, okay, so enough about RDA. So that kind of, um, that's a solution, not obviously the only solution, on how we might accelerate development of infrastructure. And then, uh, of course, the next really obvious question is who pays for all this? And um, I can talk to you about who pays for RDA and, and uh, offline, but let's talk for who pays the data more generally. So one thing you might ask is, well, what are we paying for? You know, I, I did my stuff. I put my data on my hard drive. You know, I gave it to my friend over there that I'm collaborating with. Good to go. That didn't cost me very much money. And it turns out if you, you're doing that, you're in the middle space. You're in the kind of locally manageable data. You can put it on whatever you've got. Uh, you know, if it disappears, it's a bummer, but you know, life goes on. Uh, you give it to whoever needs it, et cetera. But it turns out that if you need any of this other stuff, it gets more expensive pretty fast. Um, if you are big data, if you're an astrophysicist and you run on a supercomputer, and every time you do a run, it's 200 terabytes or more, you, you can't do that on your hard drive. And you have to have someone who will keep it for you until you do the next set of runs, which is typically a few years. Um, if your data is long lived, if you're the protein data bank or somebody who wants to keep it for 5, 10, 20, 100 years, you have to worry about who's migrating it to the next uh, technology. And how do I do that safely? And how do I make enough copies and all of that kind of stuff? That gets expensive. There's people costs, there's technology costs, et cetera. Um, if you uh, are an astronomer, you're not just interested in um, the sky surveys and the large telescope um, data. You want to slice it and dice it for areas of the sky and radio frequency. Um, you want to couple it with mosaicing services and all kinds of services. Somebody's got to pay for the development and maintenance of that kind of stuff. Um, access control. Um, if you're working with biomedical data and it's protected by HIPAA, you know, somebody's got to make sure that the systems um, are, are enhanced with policy and uh, constraints that allow only a small number of people to see it in, um, in appropriate ways. On the other hand, if you have data that everybody in the world should see. So when I was at uh, San Diego Supercomputer Center, um, we hosted um, data for the Protein Data Bank, and that had to be up 24-7 for people all around the world. And so we did special things in the machine room to be able to make sure that um, you know, there was power backup, there was replication, there was all kinds of things. So broad access, again, is expensive. So all of, all of, this, all of the extra stuff you do, curation, more management, more stewardship, more everything, more everything means more money, more costs. Now, um, what are you actually paying for when you have more costs? And this is just a slide from my time at SDSC. And what I wanted to do is see, could we be um, provide a kind of uh, data repository for the community. So we started something under the direction of Natasha Bollock called Data Central, and um, we said, we'll store your data. And we got about 100 data collections from oceanography data to art data to all kinds of things. And what we found is as our um, user base went up, we needed to keep buying storage, you know? So we were the red line. That costs money. And of course, you have to replicate 
uh, the collections to keep them safe. And that costs money. So um, first of all, the storage itself costs money. But it turns out there's a bunch of other things that cost money. You know, your failover systems, your cost of compliance with regulation, um, training and documentation, all of the software, your utilities. And so when you're paying money to, for infrastructure, you need to be thinking about all of those things, and there's a real bill associated with them. Well, you know, I think we all kind of know this, but um, then we saw in 2013 that, um, that the government said, okay, R&D agencies, data is more and more driving everything. It's more and more important. NSF and DOE and NIH and all of the agencies um, with budgets over $100 million, um, we want to... Um, we want you to work to um, provide access to publications and data that's federally funded. And, you know, makes a lot of sense. Um, but there's no new money for that infrastructure. And, of course, the New York Times very pithfully put it, you know, a few days later, we paid for the research, so let's see it. Well, the, the fact is it's absolutely reasonable, I think, for, um, for us to get that stuff out there. But who's going to pay the data bill? So around that time, um, Vint Cerf and I decided to write a little op-ed for Scions um, because the agencies had about six months to come up with plans. And what we wanted to do was we wanted to make the point that you have to factor in the infrastructure costs. First of all, you have to plan for stewardship preservation use. You have to factor them in. So we wrote this article, who will pay for data access? Uh, my very favorite tweets came from the people who thought it was pretty ironic that science made them uh, pay to read uh, uh, that article. There were some that were uh, uh, um, uh, even more blatant than that one. Um, but, uh, but, it, but it was really interesting to try to put out there a solution. So here's, here's what we basically said. Um, first of all, there's no sector that's going to carry these costs all by themselves. The government cannot do it. It's not private sector's job. Academics cannot do it. But you can share it. You can share the responsibility. You can share the cost. So um, areas that we suggested people start thinking about, um, which, uh, of course, many people are thinking about already, is um, in the academic sector. Our libraries are fabulous um, examples of um, potential and sometimes actual institutional repositories for research data. They know how to do this. They know about curation. They know about longevity. They know about law. They know about customer service. Um, they know about a lot of things to do with data. Typically, they uh, need a jump start. And you could imagine if there were programs for the cost of a supercomputer, um, th if there were programs that sort of gave a jump start to libraries all over the country to become institutional research repositories and then to develop a sustainable business model, which um, from an academic point of view, I used to be vice president for research at Rensselaer, from an academic point of view, it's very hard to do something at any, uh, org and at any academic institution this year. But it's not so hard to do it three years out or five years out, or if the agency says you're not going to get the money unless you're going to do, unless you kind of develop this part of the plan. So even jump-starting this would make a real, really big deal for all of us. In the public sector, um, the, public, the government cannot take on all of, um, all of the responsibility for the data that we generate. But they do take on responsibility for some of it. They have good plans for uh, the Protein Data Bank and for a bunch of other things at NIH. NASA uh, takes care of a lot of data. All of the agencies have certain data that they've um, really provided pretty sustainable support with. Now, our problem is we don't know which bucket we're in. I would like my, my data to be in the government-supported bucket, but maybe my data is never going to be in the government-supported bucket. And clarity about which data collections are in which bucket, and how do you get from here to here, um, I think would be very helpful for the community. We kind of create a market around alternative solutions for that. In the private sector, you know, we all go to symphonies and ballets and plays and things like that. We all go to the back where it says, you know, General Electric or Microsoft or, you know, someone else um, supported that, um, that um, in, as a public good. But, you know, our data is a public good. 
And there's no reason we can't start seeing more philanthropy from the private sector around data. So that there could be tax incentives or support in various ways to imbue, you know, the Fran Berman data collection on styrofoam or whatever. Um, and then individuals, this was one, maybe one of the most controversial suggestions we had, is that, you know, every day I look at my iPhone, I have a digital subscription to the New York Times, I've got, um, I, you know, I'll buy a Lady Gaga tune or somebody like, uh, something like that for $1.99. Why am I not paying money to the protein data bank? Why am I not paying $1.99 every time I go to the protein data bank? Why do I assume that as a professional academic, I, cannot, I, I should not be doing that? So in some sense, I think we have to take some responsibility too. Um, all of these are, are places we can push, all of us. And you know, whatever our interest is sort of pushing for more stewardship and preservation, if we start getting more in all of this, we're gonna start getting more and more, I think, real infrastructure that's gonna support you know, basically the natural resource on which the digital world depends. Okay, um, now we're getting less and less baked all the time. I wanna tell you about some new things that I've been thinking about. And one of the things I've been thinking about is culture. So, you know, you know we need infrastructure, you know that uh, uh, somebody's gotta pay for it, but you don't have tons of money. So the question is, you know, where can we put those investments that they'll do the most good? Which, which communities, which problems are most important? And um, one of the things that um, I've been thinking about, and now my good friend Myron Gutman is thinking about it with me, is something called uh, uh, the stewardship gap. So imagine this is all of the data that we deem valuable. We'll talk about value in a second. And some of it's sustainable because I put it someplace that I kind of trust to be reasonably safe. Repository or my library or, you know, somewhere else. And there's a bunch that's at risk. But how much is there? Is there really a stewardship gap? Am I just making that up? Where's the data? You know, we can't really assess what that is and where that is without knowing it. Now, um, Jerry Sheehan and a bunch of people from NIH just did a really great paper that you should go read um, from PLOS One. And what they're trying to do is understand the stewardship gap um, simply from NIH data that's in PubMed Central uh, in 2011. So um, if you get an NIH grant, you need to put the um, publications in PubMed Central. These are all the ones that came in uh, in 2011. And they're trying to figure out what's the stewardship gap there. And um, here's what they found out, really interesting methodology in the paper. Um, about 12% of the subsets are uh, down here in the sustainable space. And um, most of it, uh, almost 90%, is invisible, so they don't really know what the stewardship of that is. It, it might be well stewarded, they just don't know. And um, what that means is that there's over 200,000 what they call invisible data sets. Now, what do they know about these data sets? So um, during their um, analysis, that uh, they figured out that 87% of those invisible data sets are new, new data sets. Um, some of them are reused, so, so perhaps if we could find the useful data, we, we would have a higher percentage of uh, reusable data, don't know. And, um, and more than 50% of those data sets um, involve live things, humans or animals. So one could just posit that um, it's, it's maybe, uh, maybe that's harder to reproduce, right, because it involves living things. Well, the fact that, I mean, they're just doing this for 2011 PubMed data, um, uh, uh, you know, in the NIH archives. We don't know this about the whole landscape of research data. We don't. Um, and if we knew more about this, we could give stakeholders and decision makers and people with funding to help um, this problem the evidence they need in order to, uh, in order to attack the problem uh, in a more forceful and a more appropriate way. So what are Myron and I are doing? So we started a project, um, and it's in its pilot year, and the goals are to develop a methodology to do just that. We want to estimize, estimate the size and the character of the stewardship gap for a, a reasonable cohort of research data. And we want to really look at um, both qualification and quantification of what that is. So um, there's, you know, the questions are, are pretty straightforward. You know, how much data is there? What are its characteristics? What's valuable? 
you know, what's the stewardship commitments, and most important, what are the policy and financial implications of all of that? And um, we asked a bunch of rock star people to give us their, their good advice. Uh, you know, P uh, John Gantz has, has um, uh, looked at this issue for our IDC, and, you know, Andy Maltz has looked at this for the Motion Picture Academy, and Saeed's looked at it for Johns Hopkins, and, you know, there's a bunch of people who really have thought about this question very, very deeply. We asked them for their advice for how we kind of create this survey. So let me just, um, and we're just at the beginning of it, we're about a third of the way through our first year. Um, but um, we're developing our survey instrument uh, and, and sort of trying to pin down the kinds of questions and audiences that we want. Let's just talk about value for a second. Um, so, so one question you can ask is which data is valuable and which data is most at risk? And it turns out that that's, uh, that question is answerable by who we is. So um, if we as society presidential emails and census data and all kinds of historical records are really valuable. And, um, and, and we do a job, um, more or less okay, of being good stewardship, uh, having good stewardship and preservation for that. Um, uh, we take that on as this is stuff in the public good, we do it for the public good. Um, when we as the research community, our mileage really, really varies. Um, the Protein Data Bank, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, the Arabidopsis uh, Information Resource, um, all of those have really different kinds of business models. Some of them are at risk, some of them are not at risk. So this is a really iffy space that benefits a lot of us. And then of course, you know, if we as me, there's a lot of stuff I care about. You know, I've got taxes, these are my actual kids' graduation pictures. Um, you know, those are really important to me. The government's not going to take care of that. And, I, I'm, you know, there's not going to be any federally funded program for me to keep digital pictures of my kids' graduation. But um, that being said, um, you know, I'm taking care of that. So I know I'm responsible. And as a society, society we know we're responsible. We're really iffy on responsibility here and value here. And one of the things that Myron and I are doing is really kind of working with our planning group on really trying to even define what value is. And it turns out that if you ask these guys, you get a bunch of really different answers. Um, you know, data that can't be reproduced, well, that should be valuable. Uh, data that's in demand or highly cited, that should be, um, re uh, that should be valuable. Data that's costly to obtain, that might be valuable. So as we get more at a sense about which kinds of things these are, and how they play into what's, what's stewarded and what is not. Um, that's gonna be, I think, pretty interested. And, and of course, value is something that's dynamic. Changes over time, it's more or less valuable to me over time. Those astrophysicists, they really care about their data when it comes fresh off the supercomputer. Five years later, you know, they've done a better model, they have more refined data, they don't care so much. Um, so, so there's a bunch of interesting questions about does more value lead to more stewardship, and in the eyes of whom? So as, as I said, you know, we're getting rapidly towards dough. Um, and, and these are a lot of questions that I think it's really important for us all to think about, but we're thinking about this too. Okay, so let me just finish up with just a few things that are definitely dough. Um, who will govern the Internet of Things? And we're arguably in the Stone Age on the Internet of Things. Um, you know, we've got uh, self-driving cars and wireless cows and, you know, HAL 9000 is still relevant from uh, 2001 and Space Odyssey. Yeah, um, but, you know, the question is, what are we looking at in the Internet of Things? As we start to develop more and more wonderful technologies with more and more wonderful scenarios about how it can help us and more and more scary scenarios about how it can hurt us, um, you know, what's going to be the framework by which we decide what behaviors are okay and what aren't and which we govern in the Internet of Things. And you know, this is sort of data on steroids. Everything is data. Um, and so is this an enabling uh, uh, environment or it's Lord of the Flies? You know, who develops the laws for the Internet of Things? Who's gonna divorce, uh, uh, enforce them? You know, can you opt out? And there's a bunch of questions that um, we don't know the answer to. Who is accountable when your self-driving car hits someone? Is that you? Is that the manufacturer? Is that the algorithm developer? Um, you know, who is it? Um, which decisions should be made by your technology? If my uh, grocery store um, communicates with my insurance company and they decide I'm buying too much sugar and at risk for diabetes and my rates go up, 
is that okay with me? You know, can that all happen? Um, uh, when's your, when does your privacy matter? You know, I just came back from France and, um, you know, they said, did you go to West Africa? And, and they're trying to figure out risk for Ebola. And they asked some, some you know, personal questions. But that's okay with me. I think, uh, you know, I think that's an okay thing that they do in order to sort of protect us as a society. You know, we have a lot of sort of nuanced environments where we're not really sure, you know, whose uh, opinion, uh, who should, whose rights should, should do. And, you know, your computer. Um, does my computer know the difference between a denial of service attack and an email from Bonnie? Uh, and maybe not. Uh, well, assuming that Bonnie's not doing denial of service attacks. So there's all of these sort of questions about our technology that we need to know. So if you think about it, you know, we need a governance framework, just like any other kind of, you know, big collections of things. And so, you know, what would governance mean for the information, uh, for the Internet of Things? And um, one of the things that's been really interesting is there's a World Governance Index based on the uh, UN Millennium uh, Declaration that said, here's some key themes. When you think about governance, you're thinking about peace and security and democracy and human rights, et cetera. Well, let's try to map those into the Internet of Things. So when I'm thinking about peace and security, you know, I need to understand about you know, data security and security of my infrastructure and trust and safety and crime. When I'm thinking about a rule of law, there needs to be uh, some sort of legal framework in the Internet of Things for what's inappropriate and appropriate behavior and who takes responsibility and who is accountable. Um, when I think about rights and participation, um, do we, you know, will we have an Internet of Things Bill of Rights? You know, right to privacy, right to control your own information, right to opt out. Can you opt out from the Internet of Things? Um, so we need this kind of framework. And then when we're looking at equality and discrimination, which all kinds of governance systems look like, equality of what? Should I be equal to my toaster? And so, you know, there's, there's a lot of real issues around this governance. Um, sustainable development, again, you know, what kinds of mechanisms can we put in the Internet of Things, standards or architectures or policy or infrastructure to promote good things, evolutionary and sustainable growth. And when we think about human development, maybe the scariest part is digital ethics. What are the ethics of doing various things on the Internet of Things? Um, how do we use technology to advance it? You know, um, this is like an amazing thing, but there's also really scary things. So how, can, how do we go towards the amazing and away from the scary? So, um, you know, last but not least, um, I think this is future work for all of us. I'm certainly super interested in this. And, um, there's, and we need sort of both kind of the academic underpinnings to kind of understand this, but we need real, real structures. You're seeing a lot of this uh, in Europe. They're doing a lot of stuff around the Internet of Things. There was the Mauritius uh, Declaration for countries about trying to get at some understanding of rights uh, on privacy and, and in the Internet of Things. But if you think about it, you know, is this a society? If the Internet of Things is a society, who are its citizens? What's the ethnography of the, of the Internet of Things? Um, can I opt out? Will it, be, will it be possible to live outside it? And, you know, many of us think it, it won't be possible to opt out. So what does that mean? What should its ethics be? What is the common good for the Internet of Things? Um, uh, we have artificial intelligence. Do we need artificial ethics so our machines behave appropriately? And then, you know, last but not least, when you have governance, you know, who votes? You know, which kinds of things can come together when you have such a disparate and diverse and heterogeneous thing? So, you know, this, this is raw dough, but um, I think it's something that we all need to be thinking about as we sort of start going forward with these amazing technologies, um, I think that we have all to come to love. So, let's talk. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so I, I brought Bren here to kind of just help us just get a, a bit of a sense of everything else that's sort of happening in the background um, when we talk about uh, big data and how data moves. And um, uh, so I really appreciate you kind of starting us there. Um, we have some time for questions. Um, let's see, we have several people interested, so we'll just uh, get started. So I was interested in the idea that you have about assigning kind of what is the most valuable data that should be kept. 
The flip side of that is, do you then have to identify kind of what's the data that's like waste or could be deleted? Because that seems like something that's missing from the perspective of, you know, us sort of keeping things infinitely and they take up space in data centers as well as the utility costs. So is that part of the plan? Uh, uh, well, I'm not sure what the plan is, but um, absolutely. Uh, I think, um, you know, those marvelous, marvelous um, reports that keep coming out of IDC that John Gantz and other people are involved with about the data universe um, talk about the fact that as of 2007-ish, um, depending on, you know, the methodology, et cetera, um, uh, we started generating may, way more data than we have storage. So, so we have no choice. Now, of course, you know, the first draft of this talk, you know, is, is throwaway stuff. Um, so, so there's a lot of stuff we understand, but I think that certainly, um, I think we certainly want to talk about the costs of storing data of value and then start, try to start assigning some, um, some sensible approach to it. You know, if you think about yours, your house and my house, I don't keep everything in my house. You know, some receipts are really important. The deed to my house is really important. But, you know, some things I throw away. And there's kind of a loose protocol that I've developed that tells me when I want to throw something out and when I don't. It, but in some sense, in our professional lives, um, um, it's much coarser than that. And I think as repositories and libraries, you know, think about space and capacity and people to do the work. Um, you know, those are certainly things that we're going to have to think about, and I think it will be tied to value. So yeah. I notice you're using, um, you know, an environmental metaphor, and I would also argue, though, that the flip side of this is that environmental conversation isn't in your model. And I'm curious sort of how to think about this. So it's not just the economic cost of, um, you know, maintaining uh, data for long periods or having duplications of them, but the realistic environmental costs, right. water and power. Um, and I feel as though all of our conversations about infrastructure have historically understood environment, but our data conversation doesn't seem to understand the environment because it's happening in the cloud. And we kind of think, oh, the cloud is somewhere there and it's all good without thinking about what it takes to really build out these systems. And, you know, certainly Vince Cerf is going to be thinking a lot about that. There's a whole set of initiatives at Google where this is, this is happening. But I'm curious how you would, you know, introduce, you know, environmental factors um, into the process of thinking about these infrastructure ecologies. Um, because I think that that's something that more people need to have in their head as they make that trade off of is this something to be stored? And and does it need to be stored on a live server, or is it something that's actually much more deep storage is acceptable so that we don't need to think about the same kind of environmental impacts? Yeah, I love that comment. I think it's completely right. Um, I, I remember uh, many years ago, I had a colleague who was kind of playing around with um, computing in that sense. So what she was looking at was, if I run this program, um, uh, and, it, uh, and it behaves within the computer, um, will it take more energy or not? Will, will my program take more energy than your program? And she was trying to kind of put a framework around that. And I think what you're asking is, um, and it was off the wall stuff, as you can imagine, um, uh, for, that, uh, for that community. Um, I think what you're asking is, you know, are we thinking about this in the data world? And to my knowledge, not that many people are thinking about it. Now, um, they are thinking about the economic parameter, uh, you know, a few of them. You know, if I save this, um, how much is that going to cost me? And am I okay if I, you know, just stick it, you know, out on a tape drive somewhere because I'm not going to look at it very often, but it needs to be um, available at some point in some time frame? Or, you know, am I using it all the time? Or, you know, what, what do I need to do? Um, but I'm not aware of a lot of people thinking about that, and I think you're exactly right, because at the end of the day, we're all connected. We're all connected. And so um, if I use a lot of energy to do X, you know, um, you know, what does that mean in terms of the repercussions of that? So it's a great comment. Thanks. Um, my name is Greg. Uh, I'm totally on board with what you're saying. I'm in the choir. Uh, <laughs> 
so I want to share, I think, maybe the counterpoint, the counter perspective that I run into. Uh, and my field is mostly in civic data, uh, data about organizations and the programs they offer to people who, uh, whose needs are met by them. So there's some research potential here, but it's maybe a different field. Maybe yeah. you have similar experiences. But what I find is that most of the funding and attention and energy goes to thinking about applications and products. Right. Um, and when speaking with the people who uh, build those applications and products, who have the resources and the and the insight into what kind of infrastructure might be, might be needed, and um, their response is, you know, I just don't have time to have conversations about standards or infrastructure because I could spend that time building new features that add value to my users. Right. Um, and uh, and and so there's a collective action problem essentially, in that this infrastructure would. Uh, benefit almost everyone, although the individual part parties who could make it happen, they have incentives to essentially try to become the product that captures the market and then by defa default becomes the infrastructure. Yeah. Um, and so I wonder if you can <coughs> speak both to um, the potential drawbacks like uh, uh, to privatizing infrastructure, right, to, to the application first approach to uh, winning markets, becoming the platform and so on. Uh, and also whether whether you can by contrast, speak to the value of participatory governance in what is essentially either civic or public infrastructure as an alternative mode. Okay, I'll, I'll try to answer those in order, and if, I, if I, I'm not right about the second one, you'll remind me. Um, uh, let's talk about the private sector and data. And, um, you know, you notice I focus a lot on research data because I think, you know, we're the environment of high risk. I think in the private sector, um, People are often pretty clear about what data is valuable to them, and they make sure they take care of it. If you talk to people at, you know, Google or Microsoft or Facebook or, you know, or, uh, you know, I don't know, Morgan Stanley, um, they know their data is valuable. They really worry about stewardship um, because they know that their uh, competitive advantage is based on that. And so when things are of value to them, it's, it, it's straightforward. I mean, if you go into these companies, maybe, maybe more or less. But in some sense, they've got a plan. And if you look at um, the, uh, the research data environment, especially academia, um, you know, we all get short-term funding and that, you know, uh, for some number of years. No clue about what to do with your data afterwards. Uh, nobody to give it to often. And, um, and for us, you know, the question is sort of where does that go? Now, you can go to the private sector and say, you know, Vince Cerf, take my data. You know, I mean, Google has more, you know, uh, capacity than God, right? So, um, uh, but um, number one, um, they may or may not be inclined to do that. Um, their inclination to do that may or may not uh, be uh, stable. It may or may not be consistent over time. And, and third of all, um, as we do that, and I do think we should do some of that, um, there needs to be some rules. You know, they can't um, exploit your data in some way uh, that's inappropriate. And, but those are sort of contractual things that one could create. I mean, this is, I would love to see, and I've talked to a number of people about it, but I don't think we're there, you know, public-private uh, partnerships where, you know, um, we can go to a big company and say, we would like to host this public good, common good um, uh, data collection in your environment, you know, under various rules. And so maybe you know some of them. That would be great. Um, but, um, but I don't think we're doing enough of that. I think the private sector really could play more of a role. And, um, uh, but, you know, but, uh, but they have their own, uh, their, own, their own priorities. And oftentimes, you know, this is a very small market for the private sector. You're um, separating the, I'm Brad Burnham, um, you're separating the, um, the, you know, the notion of data that's produced through a research effort and data that's produced as a byproduct of a service that could also be the foundation for a research effort. Yeah. Right? So uh, Google obviously and Facebook use a lot of that data right. to perform a lot of research that then becomes part of the value in their business. But they also store and as you say, they, they are great stewards of that data because it's valuable to them. But it seems to me that there's sort of a fundamental misconception about whose data that actually is. You know, they're storing it in some sense on behalf of the user who's interacting with them. And if the user had more agency over that data, the user could be 
you know, could, as an example, raise their hand and say, I want to donate that data to your research project. Right, right. And then you'd have a private sector steward over data that was more directly accessible. Does that work? Well, I, I would like to see some people try experiments with it. And um, an experiment that gives you an off-ramp. You know, if it doesn't work, you know, the data, you know, goes somewhere else where it is. Um, and I, I, I've talked to a number of people about, you know, could we try that experiment with uh, different data collections? And um, I'd like to see it happen. I, I, you know, all of this, I think, is experimentation. Um, how does your university library sustain keeping people's data? What happens if they go to a new institution? How do they decide, you know, what's in and what's out? I mean, this is something we were just talking about. Um, uh, so I think all of these are, you know, there's not going to be a first out solution, but I think we have to try some experiments. So yeah, I would advocate that we try stuff like that. Uh, Fran, great presentation. Oh, thank um, you. You, you mentioned the monetary costs for access to research data, sort of federally mandated um, sort of directives on that. I, I, wanted, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about potential social costs for um, releasing data or access to data. Um, you know, I mean, I, I doubt any researcher would sort of wittingly release um, PII, um, and I'm sure there's um, a lot of sort of compliance rules already around that. Um, but even as we've seen with anonymized data sets or data in aggregate, there's still social risks involved for, um, for releasing that kind of data. Um, and I worry a little bit with sort of these government directives, particularly in the sort of development space or human rights space that receive sort of federal money, um, that sort of mandate open access to that data Whereas the organizations who are doing that data collection um, understand that releasing that type of data on these vulnerable populations could, could put them at risk um, and danger. So, what yeah, are your a great question. I mean, the fact is, we're all living in um, a pretty gray area on all of this. And, um, you know, you get the data out there, but, you know, clearly our uses of it and, um, and the way we're being clever about it and creative about it are beyond whatever privacy controls that there are, whatever kinds of uh, anonymization or not, you know, algorithms that we have and things like that. So, um, you know, I think that's going to be a consistent uh, struggle. I think in terms of the government, um, and of course the government is not just one thing, but I, I think the idea was. Um, there's a lot of data that's being created. If we can make it under appropriate circumstances, which is a giant caveat, um, more useful to more communities, you can do more innovative things with it. You know, I think there's probably very few people who would disagree with that. But, you know, I think in infrastructure, the devil is always in the details. What's safe and what's not? You know, what makes you feel comfortable when you're in um, an intensive care unit? or on an airplane, or, you know, it's a matter of kind of getting experience with the infrastructure that's going to give you predictable results in a positive space. And I think that um, in the data world, you know, that's why I say in some sense we're in the Stone Age. We're experimenting with a lot of this stuff, and that's why I think, you know, if you think about the Internet when, you know, Vint and Bob Kahn, you know, and a bunch of other people kind of invented it, you know, uh, and of course it wasn't just the two of them many years ago, um, they had no idea that we would have the kind of security and privacy issues that we have, and they didn't build it to really incorporate, you know, the kinds of protections that would be useful now. And so now we're kind of adding on. And when I think about the Internet of Things, or really any number of these things, can we build in some things that make sense? And can we build in some things that allow us to evolve in, in the way that meets our potential instead of creating a complete disaster scenario. And so, you know, I think all your questions are really good ones. And I, you know, uh, if you know some really, really solid solutions that, you know, some set of people are using, um, please, please share them with me. But I, I just think there's a lot of experimentation right now. Well, and I think, like, what I noticed at, um, at RDA was um, there are interest groups and kind of birds of a feather groups talking about um, issues around ethics and sort of social aspects of data. And, and I appreciate that there's that at a, at, a, um, at a conference that, or at a meeting that brings in people from all over the world, um, people who are working on really different uh, aspects of infrastructure um, around data to, to have some of these uh, groups that are sort of outside of government um, 
uh, kind of regulation, um, people being able to come together and sort of talk through some of those issues in the same space, I think is um, at least sort of a, a start or a positive thing, I think, to see that at RDA, that at least those conversations are happening. And while there may be some parts of RDA that are, um, they don't necessarily think it's necessary to be talking about those issues, I think having, having those um, conversations there, I think, are... Well, one important. interesting thing to look at um, is the European Commission has done a lot about digital rights, a lot, a lot. And, you know, and they have all their stuff, you know, not all their stuff, but a lot of their stuff online and um, various reports about all kinds of things. And, of course, they have a different perspective and a different setup. But um, I think there's some really substantive thinking there that's, that's worth reading. Um, I wanted to come back to the idea of deleting data and how you decide which one you can keep or not. Have you tried, uh, I wonder if there is a way to think of it in terms of archives. At one point we decided to keep documents from, from administrations and historians have developed many standards and rules for knowing what documents we should keep or not. And so do you, do you know if there are discussions trying to understand and we adapt it to data? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of discussions. I mean, you know, a kind of a really coarse uh, take on this is popularity. You know, if my paper is highly cited um, and, you know, uh, that may make my data really, really valuable. But if your paper isn't highly cited, maybe it's time hasn't come. And, you know, that's the question we always have. Um, you can't really look at popularity alone. There are... Um, on a regular basis, breakthroughs, where people, you know, found some crazy thing from 1927 and, you know, coupled it with some other crazy thing and, um, and have a really deep and non-intuitive uh, solution to a really hard problem that people have been working on for a long time. And so popularity alone can't be our, um, you know, our designation of, of value. And, and the problem is value changes and values in the eye of the beholder. So, what you really want is kind of professional communities in a way to come together. You know, chemists should come together and, you know, well, what would be valuable for chemists? And, um, you know, if you're a high energy physicist, you think uh, maybe the data coming from the Large Hadron Collider is really valuable, but most of that you throw out. Well, what they've done is, you know, they figure out some definition, some real technical definition of interesting. And everything that's not interesting, they dump. And everything that is interesting, they archive. Okay, so you can change that definition of interesting or you can broaden it or something like that, but, but they're kind of making an attempt to sort of like distinguish value from not value. So you're probably aware of the repeatability study going on out of Arizona um, for research in computer science, uh, yeah. computer systems. And so they've essentially found that, you know, most computer systems code is uh, not available even when you email the author and that even if it is, it's not compilable anymore. Um, and so if you think about code as another form of data, I was curious what your thoughts were on how to protect that. Yeah, I, that's a great question. Um, uh, if you haven't seen it, and I'm trying to, it was in one of my lectures. Um, uh, amusingly, my class that I teach uh, at Rensselaer is called Data and Society. I got to make it up myself. And um, so I love coming here uh, because you guys care about the same things I care about, it sounds like. Um, anyway, in one of my lectures, there's a little video, maybe one of you uh, have seen it. I think it's from NYU about data sharing with little panda people. Uh, and uh, anyway, um, but it's great. I mean, it really brings it home, and um, I'll find it and give it to Dana or Bonnie, and, and they'll send it around. It really brings home why data sharing matters, and it basically has one researcher, or one panda researcher, I guess, talking to another panda researcher saying, um, you know, I would like uh, the data, you know, I'm a professor of oncology or whatever, I would like the data from your paper, and the person says, it's in my paper, and no, I would like the data set. And so they go around for a while, and then the person says, well, uh, it is, uh, it's in a box. I just moved. And, you know, and so, you know, it takes a while before you get the data from the box. And then the oncology researcher says, well, I got the data from the box. I can't read it. The program, uh, I don't have the program. The company's out of business. Well, <laughs> okay. So this, the oncologist finds, um, 
uh, and it's really better on the little panda video than my description, by the way. Um, she finds the program, and then she says, okay, I got the data. Um, what's the variable SAM1? And then uh, the author says, well, that was my grad student. And she says, great, give me your grad student's uh, address. Well, my grad student has gone back to China, you know, uh, and I don't know his address. You know, so they kind of go around and around and around. This is a common experience with researchers. You know, it's a common experience for programs. It's a common experience for data. Um, and programs are hard to maintain. Um, if you think about it, you know, um, your ability to kind of get that program to run depends on everything else in the environment. You know, what's loaded and, you know, what your computer is and, you know, and all kinds of things. And so um, um, really maintaining that is hard. Jack Nangara um, had a um, kind of a program repository called NetLive for a long time. And I don't know the status of it. But, you know, part of the problem with keeping these programs were that it's really hard to maintain. It's hard to sort of create. There's a guy at CMU doing this thing called Olive. And he's trying to kind of create the whole environment. And he's doing some, and I've forgotten his name, but he's trying to do some very interesting things. So look up Olive. Hi. Um, I'm working with one of the government agencies that you mentioned that got the unfunded mandate to open up, quote, all of their data, whatever that means. Yeah. And um, they're facing a foundational problem before we even get to all of the excellent questions that you asked today which is that there's a very small team within this huge agency that is tasked with publishing their data, but they don't always know what um, equipment was used. To, they, don't, they don't know the metadata. They don't know the context in which the data was collected. It's very technical in some sense. They don't understand it. And they need the researchers to actually co cooperate and annotate and clean up their data and make it readable. Uh, but there's an issue of a lot of the researchers being from a sort of like old school mentality where they are like, we had, we, produce this data set, we used it, it's done, it's like, it's over. Um, and they don't see the value in sharing it. And I, I think part of this is like getting at the, the public good um, conversation you were having earlier. But very tactically, have you seen any people who are particularly successful at getting those sorts of folks to get on board with this notion that sharing data is good for the public good? Are there any great examples that would persuade those folks? Because without any sort of a stick, or even I'm looking basically for a carrot, and are there any sorts of carrots that you can use to convince people that this is even a conversation worth having? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that um, in systems where there is some incentive to do things, rather than it being like a nice to do, um, you have a lot more success. And so this is why I think people are trying really hard to have data journals and um, you know, it, it would be great, my, uh, my colleague Sabella Dolly at, at Rensselaer, so why don't we just have data sessions and conferences? You know, I'll present my data set. That will be a paper. I'll get a paper in the conference, you know, do it right, you know, peer review it. That would make a lot of sense. Um, we don't, we aren't doing a lot of those things. When we do them, you know, if you have a publication, you have to get it, you know, kind of solid and well-written and, um, and referenced and all of that, or else you don't get in Nature or Science or your favorite CACM or whatever journal you're trying to get into. Um, there's an incentive in the system that allows you to do it. And I think as long as we do this nice-to-have stuff, nice-to-have, you know, people are busy. You know, they're up to here. You know, you guys are going to go away from this talk. You have, I'm sure, 25 things on your to-do list just for today. Um, so, you know, so that kind of like take care of your data stuff, unless it kind of gets on your to-do list, it's, it's, it's much harder to like get a broad group of people to do it. And one more quick question from Noel. Sorry. Um, yes. Uh, what's the incentive for municipal governments or, or smaller governments to ac adopt common standards? Um, because they don't have the resources. It's just a very similar situation to the previous question. They don't have the resources necessarily to even define their own standard. Uh, and so they deal with corporations defining their standards, but yet now that there's a proliferation of different standards. Um, so wh how, do, how do we get municipal governments to not be the researchers, but you know, like the GDA? Yeah. Um, That's kind of cool. Uh, your new uh, organization. Um, uh, I, I think that, you know, economies of scale will come into that. I mean, it's just my own, you know, uh, opinion is, you know, at some point, uh, a thousand points of light are too many. You know, one point of light, probably not. But at some point, you know, if there's a benefit from having economies of scale, um, then I think people are likely to come together. And when people have come in, you know, look at the astronomers, you know, they have all these telescopes and all these surveys, 
they want to compare things to one another. They want to utilize things, uh, you know, in a synergistic way. You know, if they come together, they can create some standards that, you know, mostly everybody agrees to. They can do more. And I think um, in a municipal context, you know, th it seems to me that there's a really cool you know, kind of urban data, you know, movement kind of going on. I've seen, you know, many cities that are trying to instrument everything and your garbage cans tell you when they need to be collected and things like that. And, um, but I think as, as we, you know, as there's, there's more of that, then it's, you know, if you can beg, borrow, or steal something that most people are using and things interoperate with, um, that's often useful to you. Um, to me, the tricky part of this, um, because we, because life is political, is who gets credit? And a lot of times when we see people not adopting common standards or doing something is um, you don't get the credit for being innovative and your professional success or your resources or whatever depend on you being able to be the tall tree in the forest. So I think that in a lot of those environments, um, you know, the roadblocks are not technical roadblocks. I think the roadblocks are kind of, you know, sort of political social roadblocks that we all live with in many contexts all the time. Okay, we are out of time. Please join me in thanking Fran for joining us today. Thanks for the great questions, you guys.